Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In my last lecture on the fundamentals of EC design, we looked at a passive RC filter. So we had an input that we found was very convenient to represent in the Laplace domain, hence I'm using capital letters. And we discovered that the output was related to the input by a transfer function, also known as a system function, that looked like omega c over s plus omega c. We could plug in j omega for s in this function. So let's call this function here the transfer function, aka system function, h of s. If we plug in j omega for s, we get the frequency response. And conveniently, if we plug in 0 for omega, we get 1. So dc passes through without any problem, without any change. But if we were to plug in infinity, which I'm putting here in quotes, and by this, what I mean is as omega goes to infinity, but I'm being a little informal here, we get 0. Also, this omega c, which is equal to 1 over rc, is the half power cutoff point. And I should remind you that omega c here is in terms of radians. So if you want it in terms of hertz, you need to divide by 2 pi. So that was just a review of what we discovered last time. Now, since this consists of passive components, you can't really get any gain out of it. But what you might do is to say something like, OK, Here's my input going through the resistor and the capacitor, but maybe before I send it out to the rest of the world, I might buffer it here. And maybe I'll put a resistor here, maybe I'll put a resistor here. And this is now forming a non-inverting configuration. And let me use a prime here to indicate that this is a different output than this output. And then I could choose these resistors to figure out whatever gain I want instead of the number one. So for instance, if I were to pick the resistors to be the same, let me call this R prime and R prime. And just to be clear, I should probably now call this R since I have different resistors floating around here. And what would my gain be now? Well, it would be one plus the feedback resistance, which here is R prime, over the resistance to ground, which would be R prime. So that's 1 plus 1, which is 2. So I could say, hey, at DC, I don't have a gain of 1. I could now have a gain of 2. But if you look at this and say, well, if I'm going to be adding an op amp here anyway, is there some other way I could build this one pole filter with an op amp that might have some advantages? Now, there is nothing wrong with the circuit here. There may be circumstances where this is the kind of circuit you would want. But let me show you an alternative that has some appealing features. So now I would like to explore this inverting configuration that we had in a previous lecture. I'm going to write the input here in the Laplace domain. We're going to have a feedback resistor RF indicate the output in terms of the Laplace domain. And we're going to ground the positive terminal. Now remember the formula for this said that the output was equal to minus RF over R1 times the input. And I should mention this VO and this VI are different than the VO and VI we had at the start of the lecture. So let's extend this idea a bit. I could very well make these be generic impedances. Here's a feedback impedance. So I have this impedance going from the input to the virtual ground. And my more general formula just replaces the resistances with impedances. So if we want to build a filter, we need some sort of energy storage element like an inductor or a capacitor. Now, in a lot of electronics, audio electronics in particular, you want to avoid inductors. The kinds of inductors that you would need are big, heavy, expensive, highly non-ideal, generally problematic. It's not that they're never used, but they tend to be only used in special cases. Now, RF is a different story. Typically, RF circuits will have inductors all over the place. But here, I want to focus on capacitors. Now, if you remember, a capacitor at quote-unquote DC, 
i.e. zero frequency, i.e. a constant, capacitors look like an open circuit. So I could stick capacitors wherever I like in here without changing the gain at DC, which is what would be given by this RF over R1 term. Now, if I want to build a low-pass filter, what I want to do is I want the gain to be lower at high frequencies. And I could do that in two ways. I could do it by increasing the impedance Z1 at high frequencies, because Z1's in the denominator, or I could do it by decreasing the feedback impedance at high frequencies. So if the new tool I have in my arsenal is a capacitor, it seems to be that the best option would be to throw a capacitor in parallel with the resistance in the feedback loop. Let's think about this intuitively for a second. For high frequencies, this starts to look like a short. This resistor is getting shorted out. The overall feedback impedance is lowering, which is what we would want in order to have the gain drop at high frequencies. This is very much your standard active one-pole inverting low-pass circuit that you will see in dozens and dozens and dozens of textbooks. But rather than just showing you the result from the textbook, as usual, I wanted to talk about how somebody might have come up with this circuit to begin with. Is this actually how the circuit was invented? I don't know. But I like this explanation of how somebody might have thought of it. I haven't bothered to put a C here because I only have one capacitor, and you all are smart. Anyway, how does this formula change? For convenience, let's just change this VO to the big H to represent the transfer function. So the impedance going to the virtual ground is still R1. What about what's in the numerator? Well, we have these elements in parallel. So we'll have RF times the impedance of the capacitor, which is 1 over CS. Notice this RF is in the numerator. It's not in the denominator here. But this is all over RF plus 1 over CS. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of pull out RF from the rest of this fraction. And in a little bit, you'll see why I'm doing that. So I'll write minus RF over R1 times this fraction here, which is just going to be 1 over CS over RF plus 1 over CS. I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by S in order to stick an S in this spot. And the other thing I'm going to do is divide the numerator and the denominator by RF. So I'll have 1 over RF times C. And then down here, I'll have plus 1 over RF times C. And now this form here should look a little bit familiar. It's that one-pole transfer function that we saw for the passive filter. So let's let omega C here equal 1 over RFC, and then we can write our transfer function as minus RF over R1 times omega C over S plus omega C. If I ask a question like, what is the gain at DC? So like in the passive case, when we plugged in J0 for S, we would wind up with the omega C's canceling, and here we would wind up with just minus RF over R1. And then at infinity, it still goes to zero. So we now have a one-pole filter. It's inverting. But now we can set the DC gain by choosing RF over R1. And in particular, once we've chosen RF from choosing RF and C, the feedback resistance and the capacitor to get the half power cutoff point we want, we can then choose R1 to get whatever gain we want. Now, we still think about this as being the half power point because for this one pole low pass filter, we think about it as being half power relative to whatever the gain at DC was. So what I wanna do now is compare the input and output impedances of our active circuit with our original passive. 
one pole low pass circuit. So for that circuit, we just had the resistor and the capacitor like this. So for this structure, let's think about what the input impedance would look like. So the overall idea there is maybe we have a non-ideal voltage source feeding it, and that non-ideal voltage source has an output impedance, and this structure here may load it down. Well, then the input impedance here is going to look like the resistor in series with the capacitor, so it would look like R plus 1 over Cs. Well, what about the output impedance? Here we might imagine that this structure is feeding something with a non-infinite input impedance, and looking back into the output of the circuit, what would we see as the Thevenin equivalent if we did put an ideal voltage source here? So in that case, we would imagine taking this voltage source and zeroing it out by shorting it to ground, in which case what we would see would be R in parallel with 1 over Cs. And if you wanted, you could rewrite this as R times 1 over Cs over R plus 1 over Cs and clear the fraction and whatever. But you'll find that in a lot of circumstances, it makes a lot of sense to think about taking the parallel of two impedances as being as basic as adding two impedances or multiplying two impedances or whatever. Now, let's compare that to what we have in the active circuit. Well, for the active circuit over here, R out is perfect. It's zero because we've assumed that the op amp itself is a perfect op amp and hence its voltage output is an ideal voltage source with zero output impedance. So that's obviously a lot better than this. Now, what about the input impedance here? Well, the voltage source driving it is going to see the resistance R1 to a virtual ground. Again, we're assuming that the golden op amp rules are being followed to hold that node at that virtual ground. So as far as this voltage source is concerned, it doesn't care if it's a real ground or virtual ground. That's all it sees. The rest of the circuit has been separated from it. So the input impedance here is just R1. So in either case, you have a choice of R that affects the input impedance. But in the case of the passive filter, you also have this capacitance going on here. But there is something nice about designing with something that, even though it doesn't have an ideal infinite input impedance, has an impedance that is at least purely resistive. If you have a reactive impedance, where in this case you have a capacitance involved, or if you have an inductance or some combination thereof involved, driving circuits that have an input impedance that has a reactive nature, for instance, an inductive or a capacitive load, can lead to some sticky design issues. Another nice thing about this structure is that with the virtual ground sitting at this negative terminal, instead of just having a one input filter, I could have multiple inputs that get all added up. And I can give each of these their own inputs. So I could have a V2, I could have a V3. Each of these is going to see an input impedance of R2 or R3, or in the case up here, you would see R1. So maybe I would change this to a 1. And you could analyze each of these branches independently using superposition, as we've done in a previous lecture. Also, you can imagine having some sort of current source here. Maybe I'll call this I4, although if I'm doing everything in the Laplace domain here, I should probably make that a capital I. And as far as this input is concerned, this op amp is now acting as a trans impedance, turning this current into a voltage, but with this filtering operation. And it's not hard to tweak the formulas we did earlier to handle that case. And this can happen entirely in parallel with adding a bunch of voltage sources or as many other current sources as you might want to throw in here. Okay, the final point I want to make is that sometimes in an audio circuit, You'll calculate omega c as 1 over rc, and then you might divide that by 2 pi to get the cutoff in hertz. And what you'll find is that the cutoff will be something like 40 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz. And that's something way above human hearing. So you might think to yourself, why are they doing that? Well, in those cases, this capacitor is usually not serving a musical function, 
sometimes these capacitors need to be thrown in for stability. So sometimes you can get into these situations where the signal that you want to hear is kind of muffled and squished in some way. And then you look at it on the scope and you'll see the reason the audio signal is so muffled and squished is that there's this 500 kilohertz oscillation on top of it that's a parasitic oscillation. And maybe the thing to do will be throw in a capacitor here to try to get rid of that. Now, those kinds of parasitic oscillation problems can be nightmares to deal with, but they do crop up from time to time. The last thing I want to leave with you is a story about students coming to my office and asking for something like a 10-ohm resistor. Now, if somebody comes to my office and asks for a 1K resistor or a 10K resistor or a 100K resistor, then I generally just leave them alone because they probably have a legitimate use for it. Now, there are legitimate uses for 10-ohm resistors, but those are highly specific applications. When I asked the student what they needed the 10-ohm resistor for, they said, well, they needed to make a low-pass filter. They were making a simple passive low-pass filter. They had a certain capacitor on hand, and then they computed the R they needed to go with that capacitor to get the cutoff they needed. And I said, that 10-ohm resistor is probably going to be a nightmare because it's going to want to sink a whole lot of current, and whatever you're driving it with may not want to produce that much current. So I pushed them to go find a different capacitor so they could use a larger resistance. 